greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give. One day every tongue will confess to our God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Right.
around us, urging us to compromise. Still obedience is our watchword. Make us strong and make us wise. Secular is turned to sacred. Made the precious offering. As does the daily lives are fashioned in submission to our King.
Good morning and welcome uh, to this service coming from the South Lake Circuit from Grange Methodist Mance. Uh, you're welcome wherever you're joining us from. Um, I do just want to start, I'm afraid, with some notices. Uh, and we've, we've missed notices, haven't we, a little bit over the last, well, maybe we haven't missed them at all. Um, and it's just to remind those in the Grange congregation that we have our general church meeting at three o'clock this afternoon on Zoom. Um, for those who are able to join uh, and if you need any information if you've lost the link or you want anything just you know get in touch after this and I'll let you know what you need uh, and I will start the I'll start the zoom meeting I'll open the zoom meeting at 2 30 to allow time for those of you that that you know perhaps take a little bit more time to get on I'm not sure if you're going to get there uh, to sign in before the meeting actually starts 
Enough of that though. Um, we welcome everybody who joins us. Um, everyone is, is welcome. Everyone is part of uh, God's family. And our first song is one of our Toast Church songs uh, uh, from Fishy Music, written on the palm of God's hand, reminding us that everybody, everybody is precious to God. So we're going to sing. to our neighbour Alison who uh, has permission to have uh, given us some more inclusive words for those than, than were in the original. It's wonderful to re be reminded. I'm sure every one of us somewhere comes into somebody, uh, one of those uh, groups that was sung about in that song. So let's pray. Thank you God for your all-encompassing love that draws in every single one of us. It's hard for us to begin to grasp the breadth of it, each name written on your hand. Those we love, whose names we would willingly write on our own hands. Those who are unknown to us. And those we struggle to love, each one is precious to you. And yet your love is even wider than this. You give life to everything that has life. Written on your hand are the sparrows and the ravens and the flowers of the field, the plankton that feed whales and the galaxies that birth stars. The vastness of life is beyond our imagining, each part created in love by you. And so we come today seeking forgiveness for the ways that we have not loved enough. The times when we have been thoughtless or careless or hurtful. And for the times when we have loved too much, when we have been greedy or selfish or obsessed. Help us to love more fully, more deeply more richly and truly. Help us to keep on learning and growing in your ways of love. Amen. Amen. In Christ we are forgiven, 
loved and set free to live life in all its fullness. Thanks be to God. Amen. So here we are in November. We have two weeks left till we begin Advent, which is the start of the new uh, liturgical year, the way that the church marks time, when we begin the preparation and waiting for Christmas. Because of this new lockdown, we've lost the use of our buildings for meeting to worship again, uh, at least until we're into Advent. I think we could potentially be back in our buildings on the second Sunday of Advent if all goes uh, as planned. But I wonder how you're feeling about that. Many of you have not been back in the church building anyway since March, I know that. Some of you, for non-Covid reasons, it's been longer than that, uh, that you haven't been in church. Some people have felt very upset and even angry about not being able to gather in church. And I have to say, right back in March, when we did our first online service, we did that service from the church, and then the rules came in, at least with the Methodist church, saying that we couldn't even stream our services from the church without a congregation. And I felt angry. I felt really angry at that point. It took me quite some doing to get myself through that. Um, and some church leaders now are leading calls asking the government to give churches an exemption to the rules so that services can happen again in church. And there's actually, I was hearing this morning about a legal challenge that's being brought. Some people have been arguing that it's wrong to prevent us from worshipping in the church. I don't know if any of you are feeling that way. But the whole debate that's been going on brings up for me something that I spent some time researching at university years ago. And that is the question of what is worship? What does the Bible say worship is? What does God say worship is? And the questions are never that simple as what does the Bible say? Because the Bible is not one book. It's a whole collection of books and within it different ideas and different thinking and collected over such a length of time that ideas change and grow and they're reinterpreted. And that's one of the things that really fascinates me is how ideas are taken from um, you know, one time in the Bible and they're reinterpreted and, and brought into a new light. So this week and next, we're going to spend a bit of time exploring that question of what is worship. Um, I'll try not to make it too, uh, too academic. I'm sorry, I might get carried away because it's something I'm really interested in. But we're going to start this morning with an Old Testament reading. Um, and over many weeks uh, recently, we've been following the story of Moses. This reading jumps back into the midst of that um, to the time soon after uh, the Israelites had left Egypt. And uh, I don't know if you remember why they actually asked Pharaoh to let them go, uh, the question they put to Pharaoh that God had told them to give to Pharaoh was, was, let my people go, or God said, let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert. What did that mean? Um, our reading now um, is, is just as that worship begins. <laughs> Sorry, asking you to do too many things at once. Yeah, trying to find the uh, um, the reading. There we go. Hey. <laughs> Levitic Leviticus chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. On the eighth day, Moses summoned Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. He said to Aaron, Take a bull calf from your, for your sin offering and a ram for your burnt offering both without defect, and present them before the Lord. Then say to the Israelites, Take a male goat for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both a year old, without defect, for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for a fellowship offering, to sacrifice before the Lord, together with a grain offering mixed with oil. For today the Lord will appear to you. They took the things Moses commanded to the front of the tent of meeting, and the entire assembly came together and stood before the Lord. 
Then Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded you to do, so that the Lord, glory of the Lord may appear to you. Moses said to Aaron, Come to the altar and sacrifice your sin offering and your burnt offering, and make atonement for yourself and the people. Sacrifice the offering that is for the people, and make atonement for them, as the Lord has commanded. It all seems very strange to us. I don't know how you, uh, what you thought as that reading was read, um, but there's a whole lot of detailed instruction from God in the, uh, at the end of the book of Exodus, uh, it's all about making a special tent and exactly what it should be made of and how big it should be and what should go where and an altar. And then you get into the book of Leviticus and the first seven chapters set out this basic system of sacrifices, sacrificing of animals, sacrificing of grain and oil and incense. And it talks about some of the things that you heard Paul read about there, whole burnt offerings, um, something called a fellowship offering, another called a sin offering and a guilt offering. And each one have detailed regulations and special technical language. Some of them were completely burnt on the altar. Some parts were given to priests to eat. Some parts were eaten by the people who brought them and offered them because they were given back after they'd been offered to God. Uh, and to, to us, all of this seems really strange, kind of, you know, perhaps really primitive. We look back at it and think, well, it, it feels like, I don't know, some kind of um, stone age. You might be having have sun worship or whatever. And it seems to sort of fit with, with that way of thinking. It can be strange for us to try and understand and to see whether there's any relevance in any of it for us. Of course, that sacrificial system was never the whole picture of what worship is, but it was, in a sense, the centre of the whole system of worship for the people of Israel. And when they travelled through the wilderness, we hear that they have this tent that goes with them. But when they settled, eventually they built a stone temple in Jerusalem, the house of God, it was called, which is where the sacrifice took place. So what does all of this have to do with us as Christians in the 21st century? Well, what I studied was how the technical language of sacrifice gets reused through the Bible and applied to other things. It's used to describe other things. And I don't just mean in the time of Jesus, much, much earlier than that. And I think perhaps it begins with the recognition that the sacrifices in themselves don't necessarily reflect the true state of relationship with God. In Psalm 51, uh, it says, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise, for you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And that's that's traditionally understood as a psalm written by David when he'd done some really bad things and uh, was, was seeking God's forgiveness and knew that offering animal sacrifices wasn't, wasn't the point, wasn't going to make things right with God. And so perhaps the physical sacrifices start to seem unnecessary. Psalm 141 begins, I call to you, Lord, help me now. Listen to me when I call to you, receive my prayer as incense, my uplifted hands as an evening sacrifice. And of course, this theology, as it developed, must have become even more important to those who were taken into exile because they no longer had any way to participate in the temple sacrifices. So what was worship for them? And if we jump way forward into Revelation, John's vision of the end times after Jesus um, has, has lived and died and risen again. Um, this revelation possibly written after the Jerusalem temple was destroyed. In there it describes angels holding golden bowls full of incense, which it says are the prayers of the saints. The saints' prayers are the incense offered to God, as if our prayers are physically gathered to be offered to God at the altar. 
All the rest of our hymns today have something about sacrifice in them, and we're going to sing again now um, for the beauty of the earth. Gracious God, to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise. Can singing a hymn be a sacrifice? Well, it depends what sacrifice means, doesn't it? Um, In normal language, we tend to think of sacrifice as being a sort of a hardship, giving something up. Um, And and that might be a small thing. Or, you know, we talk about the sacrifice of lives. Maybe that is part of the idea of what sacrifice is. In the Bible, it's not really explained. On one level, uh, you know, we can look at what's said about sacrifice and perhaps it's, it's nothing more complicated than bringing gifts to God to say thank you uh, or sorry or whatever it might be um, and, and perhaps therefore going without something because you've given it to God. So maybe it's sacrificing what we could have kept for ourselves just by offering it as a gift. Sometimes sacrifice seems to be a sort of a substitution Um, You know, the the gift is given to God in place of or representing me giving myself. Um, And and at at the kind of deepest level, 
uh, there are some sacrifices that are described where it really seems very clear that the animal is being given, is dying in place of the person who brings it so that the person doesn't have to. But our word sacrifice literally means, or the root of it comes from um, Latin meaning to make holy, making something holy. And throughout the Bible, it seems that sacrifice is about restoring the relationship between a holy God and God's imperfect people. It's as if through the temple sacrifices, the temple itself, perhaps even the altar, can become almost like a holy window where we can safely meet with God. If you remember when Moses met God at the burning bush, he was really afraid to meet God. And so often through the Bible, people are afraid to meet God face to face because of God's holiness in comparison to our perfection. It's almost described as being like a, like a fire that would burn us up. Um, well, in the Leviticus reading that Paul read, Aaron needed to make sacrifices to God because God was about to appear to them. So maybe it's about purifying, making holy that space so that we can safely meet with God. We're going to hear another reading now. This is from the book of Hebrews, um, late on in the New Testament. Um, although possibly written, there's arguments about when it was written, possibly written quite early in the, in the life of the early church. And it's full of uh, sacrificial theology and imagery. And it also brings in the understanding of Jesus as a sacrifice, not to make the altar or the temple holy, but to make the people holy. Uh, thank you to, I think it's Lorraine, Lorraine. Lorraine reading this one. Thank you to Lorraine for reading for us from Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 8 to 16. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, in, uh, it's, it's not an easy book to read and understand the book of Hebrews because it's full of that sort of description of sacrifice that we we're not aware of so much because it's not been our background as it was for, uh, for the Jewish people in the time of Jesus. In the Psalms, we found that idea that an attitude of the heart is as good, maybe even better or more important than physical sacrifices and that prayers can take the place of burning incense in the temple. Here in Hebrews, it talks about how the sacrifice of praise can be the fruit of lips that confess his name. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, we could unpack that, but essentially maybe our speaking and maybe our singing can be that sacrifice, that praise of God. And then it takes it a little bit further and says, do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Suddenly, we've gone beyond prayer and praising and even our heart attitude as a sacrifice to something really tangible, the action and service in our lives as sacrifices. It calls them sacrifices. These are sacrifices that please God. And that's not just in Hebrews that we see this way of thinking. In Philippians, Paul writes about financial donations that people have given and he calls them a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God and all of those words when you get behind into the Greek they are the words that were used to describe 
the temple sacrifices. And perhaps we find it relatively straightforward to transfer the idea of the sacrifice of animals and grain and incense in the temple, much as we might find it strange, to transfer the understanding of that onto the things that we do in church, our prayer and our praise and our speaking about our faith in God, so that we understand that those are, they kind of take the place of the Old Testament sacrifice. But this here is going further in talking about doing good and sharing with others. If these things are sacrifices, surely it means that these really are worship. They're at the heart of what worship is. And so practical action and service, well, they're not the sort of worship that happens in a church building. This is worship that happens in everyday life. But it's being described using the vocabulary of that strange holy ritual that took place at the heart of the temple where only the priests could go. And I think that's really very significant, that giving of ourselves in that way to serve others is worship of God. It's as valuable to God as anything that we do in church. It's as valuable, you know, we might even argue more valuable to God than our singing and our prayers. It's taking worship outside of the building. It's no longer confined to that place. I'm go we're going to finish with a reading. I'm not going to say much more. You'll probably be glad to hear. Uh, if we were following the lectionary, this would be next Sunday's gospel reading for the Feast of Christ the King, which is the sort of the end of the liturgical year. Uh, but we'll read it today because it speaks into all of this. And I think next week I will continue because I think we have, there is further to go in thinking about sacrifice, which I will um, bring in next week. So thank you to Simon who reads to us uh, from Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25 verses 31 to 40. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep on his right but the goats on the left then the king will say to those on his right come you who are blessed by my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for i was hungry and you gave me food i was thirsty and you gave me drink i was a stranger and you welcomed me I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. So there are many things that might get in the way of us worshipping God or prevent us even from worshipping God. But I don't think that not being able to gather in our church buildings is one of them. We're going to sing again. Uh, from Heaven You Came, it's number 272 in Singing the Faith.
for our prayers for the needs of the world as we see them around us. Let's pray. Holy God, open our eyes to the holy mystery of encountering you in the service of others. We pray for those known to us who are in particular need of our prayers and our love and our support those who are feeling lonely or lost in these strange times, those who are grieving, those who are sick, those who are facing financial worries or loss of purpose. In the quietness, we bring them before you. Show us how we might bring comfort and a sense of your presence to them. We pray for those among whom we live and those we share our lives with, even if they're far away from us physically. We pray for our neighbours, for our family, Our friends, show us how we might find ways to connect with one another and build relationships. Help us to discover your gifts and your life in and through one another. We pray for all who are still hard at work in this time of lockdown. We pray especially for those giving health care, for our emergency services, for our school teachers and support staff, and for all those providing essential services from shops selling food to those emptying our bins. Give them strength for the work they do and help us to give our support and show our gratitude. We pray for our leaders, local, national and global leaders, in government, in science and industry, in culture, for all who have influence and authority. Show us how to challenge and to support those who shape human society 
so that our world might be better shaped to give love and care where it is most needed. And we pray for your church, scattered and gathered, in homes and in workplaces, in cities and in countryside, in wealthy places and in poverty, where your people are persecuted or ignored or valued and loved. Wherever we find ourselves, show us how to worship you through our service of others. Holy God, we seek your coming kingdom of love as we gather all our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Father, who art art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is number 415 in Singing the Faith. The Church of Christ in every age, beset by change but spirit-led. I, how, how apt can words be for our current times. Uh, The church must claim and test its heritage and keep on rising from the dead. So from this time of gathering, may we know that God calls us to worship in the way that we live, 
and let us go and share that holiness with all. Let's share the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. See you next week.